When Walt Disney World opened in 1971, the Magic Kingdom was joined by both the Polynesian and the Contemporary, as well as the Fort Wilderness Campground. However, while these resorts maintained pretty good occupancy, there was very much strong demand that they just couldn't handle. This was of course picked up by hotels either just right outside Disney's shopping district, or throughout the rest of Orlando. However, Epcot greatly expanded Walt Disney World in 1982, and in 1989, it would see its largest growth yet, introducing Disney MGM Studios, Typhoon Lagoon, and Pleasure Island. In this era of such aggressive expansion, it became clear that Disney would need to build hotel capacity to keep up with all of the demand that they were generating, and so Disney's Caribbean Beach Resort opened in 1988, which was then followed by a decade of new and massive resorts. These ranged from the expensive deluxe resorts like the Grand Floridian, to moderately priced offerings like Port Orleans, to other properties built around Disney's version of a timeshare, known as Disney Vacation Club, which was introduced in December of 1991. However, Disney also saw the need to provide value offerings to its consumers, and introduced both the All-Star Sports and the All-Star Music in 1994. Designed to be more in line with cheap motels for those visiting on a budget, these resorts managed to distinguish themselves through their larger-than-life theming and props, creating a cheaper but still distinctly Disney kind of experience. This was a great option for families with young children who would enjoy the over-the-top theming, but prioritized a bed to sleep in over a more relaxed and slow-paced resort experience. The trio would then be completed with the opening of the All-Star Movies Resort in 1999, really fleshing out Walt Disney World's offerings. However, plenty of new things to see and do had opened in the meantime, especially with two new parks, Blizzard Beach and Animal Kingdom having joined the lineup. Seeing more need to build even more value-priced resorts, another plan was put into place for further expansion into the early aughts, creating a new resort known as Pop Century. While the story of how only half the resort was completed and the rest left to rot has been told before, I did want to distinguish this video by taking a suggestion from one of my more prominent viewers, Ninth Shinigami, who suggested taking a look at what the abandoned resort could have been. So today, let's not only review the fascinating history of the lost Legendary Years Resort, we really dive into the potential that was lost along with it. <laughs> Before we begin, if you haven't done me the favor of leaving a like on the video yet, that would be very much appreciated. With the success of the All-Star Resorts in the 90s, and Walt Disney World only continuing to grow, the next phase for value resorts was conceptualized around the theme of celebrating the different decades of the 20th century. Construction began on the first half of the resort in 1999, which is what is now known as Pop Century today, and nearing completion, a few buildings for the adjacent resort were constructed as well. The original plan was to have these two resorts split into different halves of the century, with the unbuilt resort known as the Legendary Years covering 1900 through the 1940s, and the Classic Years covering 1950 through the 1990s. These resorts were connected by a bridge known as the Generation Gap Bridge, which it is still called today, and it would connect both resorts over Hourglass Lake, which I think is a clever thematic detail. The Classic Years Resort, which was essentially near completion and was intended to open in December of 2001, was completely disrupted by 9-11, resulting in a major tourism crash and severe cutbacks for Walt Disney World. Still, Disney announced that the opening of the Classic Years was pushed back to March of 2002, then to April of 2003, and finally, with returning attendance, it actually opened in December of 2003. Now known as Pop Century and still themed around the second half of the 20th century, it oddly enough sat without its companion resort, although the tourism industry had not yet recovered to the point where it made sense to continue construction. There was also apparently hesitancy in the C-suite to continue with the theme, 
as the Disney Wiki quotes Michael Eisner on the project, who is reported to have said, Nothing good happened in the first half of the 20th century. We had two world wars, the Great Depression. What's fun about that? So, guests of Pop Century would spend around another decade looking across the lake at abandoned buildings, including a partially completed lobby and two structurally sound but undecorated sets of motel rooms. At this point, Generation Gap Bridge was open and guests could walk up to construction walls on the other side, blocking off the area. However, it doesn't seem as if the security presence was really that strong, and because no active construction was occurring for a long time, people have shared countless stories of how they wandered around the essentially abandoned lot, which includes exploring the buildings. It's fascinating to see abandoned properties such as Discovery Island or River Country in a place as well manicured as Walt Disney World, and the standing but not very well hidden structures of the legendary years must have attracted a lot of curious people. Exploring it was apparently as easy as just walking around the perimeter of the lake with no meaningful fencing other than what was blocking off the bridge. Inside the perimeter, you would see large numbers next to the lobby building, which was likely to be named the Legendary Hall, designating the years that the resort was intended to portray. The rooms that were built seemed to be partially painted, at least on the exterior, giving you a sense of what the retro aesthetic was intended to be, at least for this area which was the 1940s section. While a lot of doors were installed for the rooms, a few were not, allowing for a glimpse into how the rooms would have been laid out. Wandering around, you could also see how land clearing and preliminary construction work created outlines for what would have been the other buildings, which was also something that you could see from either flying over or from satellite images. So if you're not familiar with the story of this resort, you might be asking what happened to it. In February of 2006, the All-Star Music opened newly renovated rooms as expanded family suites in the Calypso and Jazz-themed sections of the resort. This in itself was a market test, and because it managed to be quite successful, rumors of Disney considering the Legendary Years Resort were revived, but this time likely constructing new buildings around family suites. However, that turned out not to be the case, and instead, Disney announced in May of 2010 that it would be introducing the Art of Animation Resort in this space, themed around various Disney animated properties. The new rooms were built with interior air-conditioned hallways, abandoning that outside motel design of the All-Stars in Pop Century. The only exception to this was the rooms themed to The Little Mermaid, reusing the already two established buildings and constructing a third in the same style to match. The Art of Animation then opened in May of 2012, and I have to say that it's a really interesting and well-themed resort. However, while I do really like it, I also have to wonder what the legendary years would have been like. Before we get to the legendary years resort, I do want to cover the art of animation and pop century in a bit more depth because I think that they can provide us with more context into how the Legendary Years would have looked. And also, they're just thematically interesting, so I think they're just fun to highlight. Starting at the Art of Animation lobby, the exterior of the building is colorful and includes drawings of four different animated characters, Lightning McQueen, Ariel, Nemo, and Simba, to represent the different themed areas of the resort. On stepping into the lobby, the check-in counters on the left flow between different colors, and on your right, the wall is full of decorative sketches of animated Disney characters. As you walk along the wall, the sketches evolve to become more detailed and filled with shading, eventually resulting in the finished colored product. Here in the lobby junction, there is also a skylight from which a unique chandelier hangs, made up of different Disney sketches. From this point, you can walk into the ink and paint shop, which serves as the merchandise store for this resort, and just beyond this is Landscape of Flavors, the resort's cafeteria-style quick-service restaurant that is decorated with various painted landscapes representing the films of the different themed sections. On exiting the lobby outside, you'll find yourself in the first themed area based around Finding Nemo. This is where the main pool is located, and the vibrantly colored buildings are decorated with various props and sea creatures. 
It's also worth mentioning that you can find various large scale figures in front of the building doorways, a design feature that is found throughout all of the value resorts. In this case, the figures are Crush and Mr. Ray. If you head south, the next area is themed to Ornament Valley and Radiator Springs from the first Cars film. This is easily the most elaborately themed section of the resort, as it uses very specific props for the characters and for various locations in the film. The southwest Arizona theming is very distinct, and as you walk through it, you'll notice that the pool area is designed to be the Cozy Cone Motel. One building entrance is themed around Luigi's Casa Della Tires, another is Mater's Junkyard, and the building in the back is the Wheel Well Motel. This building is also flanked by Fillmore on the left, and by Sarge and his supply hut on the right. If you head to the north side of the resort past Finding Nemo, the next section is based around the Lion King. As you walk the path here, you'll notice various props that portray Rafiki, Simba on Pride Rock, the Hakuna Matata log scene with Timon, Pumbaa, and a young Simba, and finally towards the back, the elephant graveyard with the hyenas. An interesting thematic element is how the walls of the buildings change from vibrant shades of green and into gray and purple as you approach Scar. On leaving this section, the backside of Scar also has a Zazu figure. Finally, at the northmost point of the resort, we encounter the old repurposed buildings themed around the Little Mermaid. The buildings are themed appropriately, and you can discover various props such as a treasure chest, Prince Eric's statue, and Sebastian. This area also contains massive characters, which includes King Triton, Ursula, and of course, Ariel herself with Flounder, located in the back building just beyond the pool. Moving on to Pop Century, you'll notice that it's immediately pretty similar. The lobby building is essentially the same, but instead of the sketches on the outside, you'll now see different decades, all with unique fonts, colors, and textures to reflect their respective eras. On entering the lobby, known as the Classic Hall, the check encounters will evolve throughout the decades, decorated with photos of defining moments or distinct cultural expressions that define those eras. On your right, you can also see a timeline also divided into different decades, decorated with display cases that reflect culture and products of their time. At the lobby junction, Everything Pop is the name of both the gift shop and the quick service cafeteria, both of which are rather unremarkable aesthetically. I know that they were going for something a bit generic to encompass 50 years of pop culture, but different sections could have definitely been divided into distinct decades, just as Landscape of Flavors does with its various films. Starting from the north side of the resort, the decades begin with the 1950s. The buildings are decorated with large dancing figures, accented by props such as record discs. Along the top of the buildings, nouns and adjectives are placed to evoke that time period. Larger elements include staircases enclosed with bowling pins, a massive jukebox located at the end of the bowling pin shaped pool, and for buildings in the middle, massive figures of both Lady and the Tramp, representing the 1955 film which is a clever and thematically appropriate incorporation of the IP. What does strike me as a bit odd is the chosen paint scheme for the building though. It very much seems to reflect something that feels very 90s with its purple, pink, and turquoise, as opposed to the lighter pastel colors that I associate more strongly with the 1950s. However, if we move south into the 1960s section, which is where the main flower-shaped resort pool is located just right outside of Classic Hall, I do think that the more vibrant, psychedelic colors fit the groovy hippie theme much better. The staircases here are encased in yo-yos, and the buildings are decorated with flowers, dancers, and more words that reflect the time. Also notable are the building entrance props, including a massive can of Play-Doh, as well as figures of Mowgli and Baloo from the Jungle Book. Heading further south, the next section naturally depicts the 1970s, I think that the staircases are particularly interesting, encased in tape cartridges that are all uniquely painted to represent the greatest hits of different genres from that era. In the middle of this area is a massive, large-scale foosball table, and entrance building props include the iconic 1976 Mickey Mouse telephone, as well as a colorful big wheel tricycle. 
The buildings themselves are decorated with more dancers, platform shoes, and mood rings, as well as words and phrases that appropriately fit. Also worth noting is that there's a corner with a large-scale twister board, which is a fun detail. Moving on to the final section of Pop Century, these last three buildings combine the 80s and 90s. The staircases are enclosed in Rubik's Cubes, and while the toy was invented in 1974, it became a cultural phenomenon on its worldwide 1980 release, making it a fitting symbol of the 80s. Amusingly, the square-shaped pool is designed to be a PC monitor, with a ground in front of it stamped to look like a keyboard. On the left, the first building has a large prop of a Walkman, and on the right, Roger Rabbit is posed in front of a Toontown backdrop. These two building exteriors are themed around Pac-Man, and the dancers amusingly reflect these two decades as well, including one which is breakdancing. As you move to the building at the back of the pool though, it does become more distinctly 1990s, even straying into the early aughts. The large prop here is an absolute dinosaur of a laptop, emulating what it was like to go to a Disney website of that era, advertising Aladdin and the 1997 park edition of Test Track in 1998's Animal Kingdom. This building is also painted to be more blue and has props depicting CDs and rollerblades, which finishes off our look at the theming of this particular resort. The theming of both Pop Century and the Arts of Animation are interesting and well executed, and I'll be coming back around to comment on them a little bit later. The theming of Pop Century is especially interesting to me, and that's why I think that the Legendary Years Resort would have been a fascinating companion to experience, and I would like to once again thank Ninth Shinigami for suggesting such an interesting topic. Diving right in, I first want to point out that the partially painted 1940s buildings with their maroon and tan colors indicated that this resort's various sections would be more muted or neutral to contrast with the bright buildings of the classic years. While I won't go into the specifics, it's also a given that there will be cutouts of figures portraying popular dance styles from each decade, and various words will be placed along the top of the buildings to reflect those eras as well. Starting with the southmost set of buildings, which is where Cars is located today, there would have been two different themes. In the same way that Pop Century has two buildings themed to the 1980s and one for the 90s, or how All-Star Sports has two for football and one for baseball, the original plans for this area included one building for 1900 through 1909, and two buildings for 1910 through 1919. In terms of color, I would paint the 1900 building a nostalgic brown with gold railings, and the rail decorations will be Wright Brothers planes, done in a silly style like on Delta Dreamflight, and wax Crayola crayons, both of which were invented in 1903. As for the larger, central prop in front of the doorway, I think a retro teddy bear slumped against the wall would make for an interesting piece, as this was the decade where they became a popular children's toy. For the two flanking 1910 buildings, I think that the paint scheme should be brown and silver, so as not to contrast too much with the central gold, and the railing props for these buildings could include clowns symbolizing old amusements like the parks of Coney Island, which would be accompanied by lifesavers, invented by Clarence Crane in 1912. One of the large props would be a Ford Model T, which was first produced in 1908, but continued to rise in popularity throughout the next decade, as the introduction of the assembly line in 1913 transformed production capabilities. The adjacent prop of the other building would be some sort of rendition of a crossword puzzle, introduced to the world by Arthur Wynne, also in 1913. This section of the resort was also intended to have a pool where the Cozy Cone Motel currently sits. And so in the traditional Pop Century and the All-Stars, with their specifically themed pools, I would have themed this pool around the Steeplechase face, the mascot for Steeplechase Park, which was the first on Coney Island. It's a bit creepy, but I think it would have made thematic sense. While I would have also liked to include baseball in this section of the resort, I don't really want to cross over with any of the themes at any of the other value resorts, and baseball does already have its own building at the All-Star Sports. 
Speaking of which, jazz would make for a great theme for the 1920s section of the Legendary Years, but it too is already covered in the All-Star music. In this area, located where the Finding Nemo rooms are found today, the 1920s actually seems to be the easiest to theme because there are so many iconic symbols from that decade. However, I think that one of the better ideas might be to paint the buildings white with black or gray railings, theming and shaping this central pool to the side wheeler from Steamboat Willie, which obviously has a lot of significance, not just for Disney, but as a milestone in animation when it debuted in 1928. One of the props for the buildings could include a giant Mickey at the wheel of the ship, and on the other end, a movie camera symbolizing the rise of the movie industry and its studios in the 1920s. Cutout props on the railings could include radios with music notes, as well as women's cloche hats with flowers in the brim. While the idea of evoking the concept of prohibition might seem strange in a family resort, it was conceptualized in the Eisner era after all, and I don't think a small reference would be out of the question. In fact, Pop Century has a surfing goofy figure placed in front of what I believe is a 1960s Corvette, and so a photo op with a modified bootlegger vehicle would be a thematically appropriate addition just off to the side of the pool area. Moving into the 1930s, which is currently the Lion King area, there actually seems to be surviving concept art of what this was intended to be, featuring a Monopoly board at its center. It appears that the building on the left features a rotary phone, and on the right, it's a bit unclear, but I believe it's intended to be a 1934 Buck Rogers space rocket toy due to the coloration. This is further reinforced by a photo posted in a video by Florida Urban Exploration, showing what appears to be the unfinished ship dumped in front of the lobby building. It's difficult to determine what else decorated this area, or what the dancing figures were intended to be, though I do think it may portray one partner picking up another in swing dancing. Finally, while the painting for the 1940s area was not finished, I do believe that maroon and tan were the intended colors, or at the very least would have worked well for it. While it's difficult to really express the 1940s for a themed resort like this, as the first half was dominated by World War II, and the second half would be more stereotypically associated with the 1950s, I think there are a few interesting places you can go with it. I would propose a circular pool, designed around the frisbee which was first commercially produced and made from plastic in 1948. The center prop behind the pool would either be a radio or a microphone, symbolizing the importance of FDR's fireside chats. While I think that World War II should generally be avoided as a theme for this resort, the idea of a president communicating so directly to Americans in times of crisis, especially during war, is something that can really symbolize this era in a positive way. On a less serious note, another prop I would add is the Slinky, which was introduced at Gimbel's department store in Philadelphia in 1945, selling out almost immediately and taking off as a popular toy. The final large prop would make sense as something from a Disney film, and while I think that Fantasia is probably the most iconic and artistically significant of the 40s, it is already present at the All-Star movies. However, I think that a figure of Bambi would make sense as a 1940s symbol for the golden age of Disney films, and is, in my opinion, the most beautifully animated of this era of films, which I think makes it a perfect fit. I won't cover cutouts for the railings because it's difficult to really come up with ideas, but I would have been interested to see what Disney would have come up with, not just in this section, but for the entire resort, especially since they have the money and resources to consult pop culture historians, and would have likely produced a lot of really interesting themes. While I think that the art of animation feels a bit more polished and is the better resort when compared to Pop Century, with its better themed lobby building and those interior hallways, I do think that thematically overall, it is actually less interesting. A lot of it is really well done, especially the cars area, but what makes Pop Century more intriguing to me is how it reflects the cultural zeitgeist of different decades. While there's something wrong with Disney IP, and that's certainly present where it makes sense for these buildings, I do like how the cultural representation has more depth than just simply adding characters to something. If I can use a different kind of comparative example, 
I would use the Haunted Mansion and Rise of the Resistance. Both are good attractions, but Rise of the Resistance is just a story set in the Star Wars universe, and there's not really any depth beyond that. However, the Haunted Mansion creates its own distinct cultural impact through how it borrows elements from various ghost stories, ancient legends, and cultural trends, such as 19th century spiritualism. I have an older video discussing not just the history of the Haunted Mansion, but also the fascinating culture and history behind it if you're interested. But the point I'm making is that original thematic ideas have a lot more depth because they're often so entrenched in history and culture. There's a lot not just to see in the Haunted Mansion, but a lot to learn about it culturally, and that simply just does not apply with something like movie IP. The same applies to these two resorts as well. The movies of the art of animation are great, and their thematic areas are executed well, but they lack the cultural depth of Pop Century and even the All-Stars. Pop Century in particular is often campy with a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor, but if you took the time to research the different elements around you, there's a lot of depth and great stories behind them. I think that if the Legendary Years Resort had manifested, it too would be an interesting exercise in depicting 20th century culture. Hopefully, my ideas were interesting and culturally relevant enough to give you a sense of what this resort might have been like if built, and I think it would have been an interesting but nostalgic companion to the classic years. It certainly would have been less colorful and a bit more drab, but it may have also evoked an atmosphere of nostalgia that we managed to experience on Main Street USA or in the Carousel of Progress. I don't think that the art of animation was a bad addition by any means, but it does lack that cultural context that we would have gotten with the legendary years, and the addition of the resort wouldn't have left Pop Century in such an awkward spot, celebrating only half a century. So, if you made it this far to the very end of the video and haven't yet hit the like button, that's something that you can do to really help me out. As always, if you enjoy videos like these but haven't yet hit the subscribe button with bell notification, you can do so now to be alerted to new videos as they release.